data quickly, get results back from the labs and radiology and, and so forth. And they could also place orders on patients, basic stuff, like with the pharmacy and with the laboratory. They didn't have to go do all the paperwork and things moved quicker and the, and the docs really liked that. And then as the systems grew, uh, the docs found themselves becoming more order entry clerks, you know, having to input data and they, they didn't feel that same return that they got from that initial effort with, you know, results retrieval, order entry. And I think that's created a sense of frustration. And as time has gone by, uh, more and more people have added things they want put into that. And it falls upon the clinician uh, at the patient provider interface to input a lot of that data. And they don't feel they're getting a return back from it. It's led to a point now where on the high end of medicine in this country, we're, we're really starting to see an explosion in what we call boutique medicine. And that's where you put a doc, if you, if you got the wealth, you, you put a doc on retainer and they become your, your physician and they guide all your health care. And if you go and look at these kind of practices, they've really skinnied down their use of electronic records because they consume so much of the time. And the, the thing that the, the patient is paying the doctor retainer, and these retainers usually go for a grand a month or more, okay, the thing they're paying the provider for is availability and face time. And if the doc's time with them is spent inputting into the computer, they're the patient feels they're not getting their money's worth. The doctor is just playing with the computer. So we're seeing this split occurring in our, in our health system, where you've got the big systems, the Kaisers, the military, the VA, so forth, where all of this data entry is going on. And it's estimated now that docs are spending at least 20% of the time that they have with the patient inputting data okay and that's taking away from the time the patient has to interact with the provider so i think that's causing a problem so we need to be able to skinny this down so that the only inputting that the clinician is doing is that which is absolutely essential now i think the whole the the, the story that we just heard about you know contaminated information on patients goes way back okay when we had paper records that was pretty easy to find you know we found somebody else's progress note in the in a record we just made a big x through it or we ripped the page out <laughs> throw it in the garbage can you know that was pretty easy in fact if pack back then you know the, the, all the rules that we've established about patients uh, owning the record and being able to give input back then Patients would read their record and they saw something they didn't like, they'd rip it out <laughs> and throw it away. You know, it was, that was in, in the military system. It was really great. Uh, so we, we had our sort of our own self-policing processes, you know, going on. One thing that's really interested me, and when I retired from the Navy, I, I went through this course and they asked everybody to think about what they wanted to do in retirement. And I said, well, I want to be part of making the electronic health record a reality. For, well, boy, I had no idea what I was stepping into. I mean, my God, you talk about job security and perpetuity. That's it. I mean, this Hummer has grown like Topsy. You know, I was a pediatrician, so I never interfaced with the VA as a clinician because that's one thing the VA doesn't do is pediatrics yet. Okay. But... Then when I got into administration, I started to deal with the VA stuff. And, you know, it's like, this goes back to 1980 for me, when we first started talking about VA DOD resource sharing and sharing. It always seems so stupid to me. I mean, why can't, if we're going to make an electronic health record, why can't we migrate all that data to the VA? Here we are, you know, way over 30 years later, we still can't do it, you know? And I can't understand that, except that I understand the human element of it. And there are people on both sides of that fence that don't want it to happen because it's job security for them to not have it happen. 
Okay, so as long as they can keep rolling the ball that way, they're going to keep going that way. But one of the big drivers in our country right now is to get this, to integrate the electronic health records between these two big federal institutions. And we now, now they've just announced that they're not going to do it. They're not going to have the same system. <laughs> they're going to have a, a system that will talk to each other. Oh, man, this is just, they're just rolling that can further down the street, you know, to keep it going. They, they could do this, but they're, they don't seem to want to make that progress. Okay, how, much of the, how many of the people that are in the DOD system are ever going to interface with the VA? Damn few. Because most of the people in the military health care system are retirees, their dependents, Dependence of active duty. Those people aren't going to the VA, at least the way it's constructed today. The only ones who are going to ever interface with the VA, in all likelihood, are ones who served a short time, two years, three years, four years, got out, some point down the line, decided they got a problem that they think is compensable, and they're going to go confront the VA. Okay? That's how this thing works. So this isn't really a really huge problem. Okay, they ought to be able to fix this thing, but they can't. But they're, they're migrating now. They're kind of getting there. They're, they're digitizing all the paperwork and all that stuff, and they're getting it to the VA people. They've got an overwhelming problem, but they're gonna, they're, they seem to be getting some traction and getting there. But I do think this, that problem is solvable. I don't think it needs all the data elements that they're requiring providers to input to it. That's one of the things I think docs really, providers really want, is a system that'll help them make a diagnosis and do it quick. And, they, and you don't have to have data that is instantly available anywhere in the world. Because guess what? Most of the people in the world don't move all over the place. They stay in one, still, they stay in one place, and that's where they get their health care. Okay, we have a few people who move around, but not, not many uh, in our whole society. So the whole idea is of, being able to transmit the last CT scan or the last uh, uh, cardiac study across the planet to some other place, that isn't really necessary. It doesn't have, we don't have to have access to all data at all times. So I'm a big fan of the blue button uh, idea uh, so that people can access Summarize data. Just a second. Uh, we have somebody who's making a lot of noise on the line. Can you mute your uh, revolt for a while, please? So, okay. I'm a big fan of the blue button concept. I think we saw a great example of a early phase of that back during Hurricane Katrina, uh, in the follow-on to Hurricane Katrina, where we had all of these people from Louisiana who we didn't know much about. But we found out we could figure out what their health problems were by going and getting their pharmacy data. And, you know, virtually all the pharmacy data in this country is resident, or at that time was resident on like four or five computers nationally. Okay? Uh, and we were able to go in, grab all that data, pull it out, and when we get the patient in there and we'd say, well, what kind of pills, what were you on? Well, I took the white pill in the morning and the blue pill at night and all that stuff. You could go and look at their pharmacy record, and you could see what medications they were on. You could replace those medications. You could also pretty well construct a medical problem list for them. You knew they had diabetes, they had heart disease, they had you know, COPD, whatever, and you were able to construct that. So there's systems like that that we could work on that would enable us to quickly get a picture of what the patient has who shows up in our primary care clinic, our community health care clinic, our emergency room, you know, and, and they don't know all the details of what was going on with them, but they can give you, a, well, yeah, I took a white pill and a blue pill and pink pill, you can pull that together, sort of the blue button type thing, and get us started. Okay, then if you need the real fancy stuff, then you build the systems to go get the real fancy stuff. How's that? Well, I think you're being awfully optimistic saying that we're making progress. So, <laughs> <laughs> I, 30 years ago, I had a working VA DOD interface. It used a, uh, a pre XML format. We used a direct light protocol. And uh, the woman who worked with me on it, Best People, who was, uh, Best People, who was uh, 
at March Air Force Base, and I was at Loma Linda, just sent me a message when she saw the EHR, and she said, IEHR, and she says, have I been asleep for 30 years? If nothing seems to have changed. Uh, we had two prototypes. We had uh, congressional committees. We had this, and we had IOCs, and everything was where we are today. Uh, but we had it for about one hundredth the cost of where it is today. So I, I see us. The fact that we've made it cost more, somebody's getting rich. Yeah, <laughs> and the and the worse it gets, the more money they make. And the more we break things into pieces, I call it the Humpty Dumpty syndrome the more we hire people to try to put it back together again. Sooner or later, the king is going to run out of money and can't pay all the king's men and all the king's horses to do more integration. And what happened was VA, VISTA, and DOD, CHCS were up here on the wall. They fell off. The bureaucrats got a hold of them. They, they broke them into pieces. And instead of lifting them up into a higher level of abstraction and higher metadata and, and greater uh, associative properties, they broke it into pieces. So IEHR now has gone to, uh, for DOD, 27 separate pieces, 27 different RFPs to break it into pieces. They're going to integrate these somehow. Uh, that's downstream. They haven't figured out how it's going to do it. But these 27 separate RFPs only covered about 40% of the functionality that was already in VISTA. And VA and, VIST and DOD already share an incredible uh, metadata resource through the data dictionary, and that was designed in it from the scratch that we could uh, build these together and pull them up into higher level of integration, or of, of association, not integration. And instead, they're throwing it all away and reinventing everything and, and just throwing the company off the wall again. And this happens about every 10 years. Congress gets upset. They call a hearing. They huff and puff at the secretaries. The, the secretaries say, well, yes, we'll, we'll do it right this time. Uh, they change the name of the program, and they quadruple the cost of it. And next 10 years later, they do it again. So we're in about the fourth cycle of this. So I'm predicting in uh, 2022, uh, we're going to have a congressional hearing, and the VA and DOD aren't sharing. The eligibility isn't working. We need another $20 billion to, uh, to integrate what we've had. But um, I think we need a, a radical clean slate. We need to rethink what we're doing. Uh, John Madison was saying last night that after 35 years of medical informatics, we still haven't standardized blood pressure. So if we can't uh, even handle blood pressure as a standardized data element, somebody needs to come through with a different model. And in all, all the while this has been going on, we've had Wikipedia come up, we've had Google, we've had eBay, we've had eight, Facebook of people who understand the network effect and scale and have changed society. But I do not see that in healthcare. I see us going backwards. We're digging a hole, trying to get out of it by digging it deeper. Actually, and so, a comment on that is that you, you can identify the places where this can happen in a country. Basically, there's two steps. First of all, you have to convince everybody that something is absolutely essential for national survival. Okay. A. And then you have to convince people that it has to be done by the government. Once you've done those two things, you have put in place an incentive system that pr produces exactly what you're talking about. And as, as, as an example of the alternative in the USA, uh, look at uh, the, the cost of groceries and yeah. food. It is something that's absolutely essential for, right. for national survival. We lack the second feature so far. Which is? That is something that has to be done by the food, food delivery and production has to be a government function. If we can only get that into place, there's a ground floor industry for another family of trillionaires. I see, okay. Uh, or just one, one trillionaire controlling everything. Uh, anyway, uh, um, okay, this is uh, supposed to have been MDs talking about their worldview. Um, what, what do we need and how do we uh, Well, I, I think it? we're seeing that to some degree with the entrepreneurial guys who are starting these boutique practices. They're defining what they need to do their practice, okay, and their patients like it because they keep paying them that kind of money to do that, okay, and these guys have really dumbed it down and simplified it so they can be efficient, okay? Maybe we need to take a look at that model, you know, and say, gosh, maybe that's where we need to go, you know, rather than keep building this. But what's the, what's the name for that model that would be most widely recognized, concierge? Or Con pink well, pink boutique pink medicine, pink. concierge medicine. Uh, sometimes they call it executive medicine to be really polite, you know, it depends. But it's all the same thing. Right, you, right. you pay a premium. You know, th these guys in the extremes, they don't, they don't, they don't bill Medicare. Okay, you, you can be Medicare eligible, 
but they don't even bother with Medicare. You just pay cash. But you know what? There's a lot of people in this country who can pay cash for their health care. They don't need insurance. They don't need Medicare. They can just go in and open a wallet and, and pay for it. So that's how it's happening you know, at that level. So maybe that model is one we need to look at. I want to say one other thing, this, this whole thing about big data. I think we're learning more from big data than we are from all this health record stuff. And we're, we're spending hundreds of billions, of, not trillions of dollars on this health record system. And what Google and all the rest of these guys are doing, I think we may be learning more about health from that than we are from all this other stuff. Quick question, is there a hybrid, you think, between the concierge and other services where you have a, a concierge, a, a gatekeeper, if you will, medical professional, but you can still be, re you can still be referred by that physician? Let's I say. think that's what they're trying to evolve with, with this accountable care organization, uh, you know, where you're assigned to a provider, but that's a provider group, and it's not just MDs, but it's the whole panoply of you know, psychologists and all the other you know, ancillary groups that can bring th their combined talents together to help patients. Now, the vast majority of people don't need that. The vast majority of people just, they, they need three to four visits a year for acute care things and everything goes along well, okay, and, and the, the, you know, the preventive type things. And that's, you know, where not, not even family practitioners play a role, but you can migrate a lot of that down to a, to a non-physician provider level, the PAs, the nurse practitioners, that kind of thing. So, yeah, I think there's a possibility for us to build a system that would be much less expensive and far more responsive to people's needs, but it's a, it requires a big culture change. I'd like to push back a bit, and I, I can do that since I'm a physicist, not a physician. So a couple things. One thing, Harold, you mentioned, we don't need to make this data available anywhere in the world at a moment's notice. But the fact is, we already have that infrastructure. It's been developed, it's been paid for, we only have to use it, and it's not expensive. Number two, I want to juxtapose those two points you made. One is that we don't need the EMR for all of these operations to collect the data. But on the other side, you also mentioned how big data approaches of Google's and Microsoft's and Facebook, et cetera, is actually able to extract useful knowledge that can be shared with others and can benefit people, can save them from, from disease, preventative or addressing problems, et cetera, life extension. So to me, there's a, a serious need. I, I see the concierge medis, medical practices, if that's, I'll talk about the ones that you're mentioning that are streamlining the process and not collecting the data. It means that that data is not going to get, ever get into the human knowledge base to inform diagnosis and treatment. And as a conversation we had with John Madison on Monday when, it's like there's not just one diabetes, there's not two. It's almost where every individual phenotype is different. And it's going to take big data approaches, but people like Google and Microsoft aren't allowed to touch that data that could inform these big data decisions. So I, I think there, the technology is there, we can make use of it, and it's the humans, especially in DC and the politics that are in the way of all of this. Uh, with well, that, I like that part I'd agree with. <laughs> okay. but, uh, I was going to say there's, there's, two, there, there's two sides to that it's available everywhere we have the infrastructure. One is you can be anywhere in the world, get on the internet, break the glass, and get into your medical records. The other is the provider, if they're not familiar with that environment, may not be comfortable with it. So you still have, there's still this translation process Absolutely. and everything, and 99% uh, of it's still local delivery. Uh, excuse me, are we, we are we losing battery power? You're about two minutes away. What? You're about two minutes away from losing battery power. Yes. About, okay. Okay. <laughs> so we have to have lunch in two uh, minutes, basically. <laughs> uh, Reed, you wanted to say something? I get one of those two minutes. Okay. <laughs> one one works on phone. I, I wanted to say. Yeah. So, uh, which way? Uh, who's up? Just look up. Okay. So ba we just lost thirty seconds. This is quick. So um, I, I I think that <clears throat> Eric, your point is is well taken. Um, it, 
may have something to do with policy, politicians, but it also, I think, has a lot to do with the way data is presented. So when we see a list of ICD-10 data and need to choose from 100,000 options, it doesn't help, and, and we avoid those tools. We need the tools to be able to sift and sort and assimilate information to make decisions very quickly. So that's a link there that's missing. You can have all the big data and all the data if it's not processed and presented efficiently, streamlined, where we can make a split-second decision, have it affected, we're not gonna use it. And we've seen that time and time again, we can talk more in detail about that, but where we've put all sorts of complex CDS tools in place, they're just not used because the docs find the path